Okay, oh, that might be but do we want that in but anyway, so obviously she has a lot of that very Yeah. She well I haven't seen it. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Well, I think see that's it is tricky because belly is such a do you know what I mean? So, you know. <laughs> I don't think so I said, well, oh, but you can't know but I said the well they could they could go once four nights, do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, but that would that would probably work out. Well, if that was the case, then do you know what I mean? There was do you want to quickly have a look and see if she was here? Um, the app, um, well, what I was going to say, yeah, okay. Mm. Um, Oh, can you hear me now, people? Yeah, it was me. I think you muted everyone. Sorry. <laughs> I blame Kathleen. <laughs> um, so, yeah, working, probably just a good point for all of you who didn't hear that. Um, you know, people kept, you know, a lot of this conversation around primary and secondary is being really different, and we are not. Uh, we're sending grade sixes out to you a couple of, you know, months later. They're in your classes. So, um, we hopefully will be able to share um, some really exciting learning that's happened for Belinda, myself, the team at Mount Rowan. I know I'm coming back to Canadian Lead and talking about Mount Rowan here. Um, Sue and I would text about the data at their school <laughs> and sometimes think, you know, we're really invested in that and seeing the progress that they've made. So tonight we just want to share the journey um, that we've had over the last 12 and a bit months now. Yeah. Um, and I think, yeah, for all of us, we can take some things from this, particularly if we're working in five sixes. Um, but I think as schools reaching out to our feeder schools, knowing who they are, uh, what assessments they're using, what their literacy or numeracy block even look like, for them to come in and have a look at primary schools is such an awesome opportunity. Um, so I think, yeah, the main message tonight would be just to reach out to those feeder schools, um, you know, check in, see if you can arrange your time to meet. And that's exactly where Mount Rowan have headed um, this year. So Belinda can chat to you a little bit about that. So that's just a bit of how this came about. Um, it's probably provided us with the opportunity now to reach out to our feeder schools um, and have that same conversation because Mount Rowan is the other side of um, town for us. So now it's about us thinking, okay, how can we work with our schools around us? Um, and that process has started as well. So we might make a start and I'll just go through... Oh, my clicker's not working. That's okay. No, it's happening, Zoe. Anyone sure? <laughs> yeah. That's okay. I'll just talk about caffeine six and that. Um, we started with Paula. Um came to me and said, I've been working with Mount Rowan. They are grappling with some literacy data, so reading data, and they're not sure where to go. Can you come and have a chat with them? So I went, okay. I don't know how to help a secondary school, but that's fine. So it started with me and Paula just coming across. Um, we talked about what we were doing in five sixes here. We had assessed everyone using dibbles, um, had words per minute. We were able to identify students who were reading 
uh, well below expected level in year five, six. Um, and then we were able to make some adjustments for those students. So I presented literally what we had been doing. Um, and the team at that point, there was four of you, but this is here tonight as well. So welcome. Is there four of you initially? Um, oh, in KD, three. three. Yeah, three, three of you. Um, and we sat down, we looked at the Dibbles data, our Dibbles data, and we just went through what Dibbles was, how you implemented it, the scores it gave you, and basically what it meant. These guys jumped on board and said, right, we've got nothing like that. We're going to go and assess all of your, how many would you assess? Uh, all the year sevens, or oh, half of the year sevens, half of the year eight, so probably around 180 kids. Yeah, so we went back, assessed 180 kids and said, we'll get it to you in a few weeks' time. And I was like, okay. Um, so that was really exciting. Once I started assessing them and working out where students were, and we going, yeah. We just skip that to that one. Perfect. They knew, so we looked at the data funnel and they knew that they had their curriculum data and they had scores there, but didn't really know where students were sitting and reading. Was it at grade two level? Was it at year five? I had sort of no idea about where we needed to dig deeper. So that's where Dibble sort of came up. So then we talked through simple view of reading. Um, the girls had an idea of all of this and had been doing their own sort of professional development. Um, and we just went through, you know, Scarborough's reading rope and talked about word recognition and that my hunch was probably they had a lot of students who couldn't decode and that for me, I felt quite comfortable in, um, you know, helping them with some strategies where we could have a bit of a quick fix there and get a lot of students who potentially just hadn't been taught out of that sort of red um, lot in the dibble. So that was our hunch at the time. Um, so we decided to sort of you know, go through the inquiry cycle. It was a long inquiry cycle, it was 12 months, um, but we just jumped back and forth. So Belinda might just talk about literacy skills lesson because that's the high school context that I'm not familiar with. So what we do? Yeah, so you, you actually changed your timetable. Yeah, that does come up. Does come up. Yep. You want to mention that quickly now? Um, so we recognised um, that we needed some literacy intervention. So last year we had our year sevens and eights had two literacy sessions a week for half a semester, uh, half a year, so a semester, um, and we paired that with Spanish. So um, the concern is if we have kids that are reading at 100 words per minute or less, uh, for some of them, they're in Spanish for the first half of the year. And when you're trying to learn a second language and you're not even familiar with your first language, um, we were hitting a, whole, a lot of roadblocks in terms of um, behaviour and, and other um, issues in the classroom. It was one of the reasons um, that this year we looked at what else we could change, um, as well as the data that we were getting back and the growth that we were seeing. So this year, what we've done is we've taken an additional lesson off English. So instead of doing five sessions a week of English, they do four, which is where they're doing some kind of novel study or skill-based activity um, around the curriculum. And then we have three literacy sessions for the entire year for every class in year seven and year eight. And we'll talk about the tiered system that we have within that. Um, but it was a massive structural change that we've made this year, um, recognizing that these students really needed that intervention three times a week um, to get the highest impact in terms of growth. Um, so yeah, we've made that change this year and it's going really well so far. So I think that's just a really good point to know that um, you know, at the start of the year, your leadership team were really willing. They knew there was a problem with that data. They were willing to change that whole timetable. Um, and then it's gone even further this year with that extra lesson. So we just talked through um, Dibbles. These guys went off and assessed all of those students and came back. And that was really exciting. They sat down. And even though it was quite, I think you guys felt quite deflated with the data because it was you know, there were some students there who were sitting really low down in that red part. Um, and you can see up here, there was 30, 34 students across the seven and eight group that were reading below 100 words per minute. So straight away I went, great, that's exciting. We can do something about that. Um, and then we'll be able to see a big shift of who then does have, um, you know, some real problems that we can really do some intervention around. And that's where you're sort of at now, I think you'll talk about. So this big shift was able to happen. Um, so we just went through, um, these guys made a table, sent it through. You could see exactly who was in that bottom hundred um, and we could identify how many words. There was a group that were really incredibly low um, that didn't know all sounds. Um, so we were going right back there. Um, then there was a group sort of sitting up around that 
60, 70, 80 mark, which we knew we could easily get up to 100. They could read, they just had not really poor decoding skills um, and their fluency was just slow. So we knew that by implementing just fluency activities, that could lift. So there's a little snapshot. Belinda, do you want to talk through? This yes, is so old this data is, now because it's this last is year. data and I will give you an update. I don't have it on the slides, but I'll give you an update of what we're up um, with our data this year because it is really exciting. But um, of our year sevens that we tested, so it was only half of our year seven cohort for the second semester. 33 students were in red. And if you're not familiar with Dibbles, red is risk. Um, so significant risk. And um, anything from 100 words or less is a, equivalent to grade three or lower in terms of fluency. And if you're around 60, you're around a prep one, two um, level. So if we have kids in year seven who are reading down at 76 words per minute, um, they are well below, like you're talking seven, eight, nine years of, of difference if um, they're up in years um, nine or 10 as well, because we are doing this in year nine and 10. So 33 students were in red, um, our lowest result was 48 words per minute um, of students, and that's not including the errors that they were getting um, in that one minute read. Uh, 23 of the students in year eight at the time were in red, and the lowest result was 49. And what we're seeing is a pretty similar mirror between seven and eight um, at the moment with our data. It, it's not changing drastically in terms of what's coming in um, at the moment and our base level, if that makes sense. Um, and unfortunately, we're finding in year nine and 10 as well uh, with our TLI money and our um, tutoring money and our Mylan's um, funding that when we're doing these Dibbles tests, even though we're doing a year eight test, because that's what Dibbles goes up to, our students are still coming back, you know, in the low 60s or lower um, words per minute. So. Um, it's, it's, I guess, Alice has um, sort of touched on it for us as secondary school teachers and myself, especially, I always felt there was a gap in my understanding. I didn't know how to help students who were reading at this level. I didn't even know how to identify what level they were actually reading at. Um, I knew how to help kids once they could read and we can work on comprehension strategies and skills and we can work on writing, but I didn't know how to help them or identify them. That's why it's been absolutely amazing working with Canadian Lead and Alice because we now have very clear structures and protocols in place to identify our kids and each time we go through the system, uh, we find more and more ways to um, unpack further. So we're getting better at saying, okay, this student has this level of reading, but what else do we know about the kid? And we're starting to then unpack, well, they need phonics, they need a, uh, some kind of intervention, um, they need to do some cognitive assessments. We're getting a lot better at that. Um, and we're also feeling more familiar across the, the board from prep right up to secondary school for intervening and helping. Well, would you just say she gets confused? Well, they want me on screen. Yeah. Yeah, sorry. No, yeah, you are. And I think it, it's all, it sounds amazing and it is amazing, but it was tricky at the start. There was yeah. lots of specialist teachers who were going, I teach science, I need to get through this. Um, so there were those bumps along the way where these guys had to go, yeah, we get that, but we really need to teach them to read so they can access your textbooks. Yeah. Um, you know, so there was a lots of conversations around, um, and I think you guys were really good at this at Mount Rowan was saying, okay, how can we link, you know, some science things into our intervention session? So just being really, yeah, creative with how, you know, how you're doing things. And then I think lots of people have realised the impact it's having um, and the importance of it. Yeah. So basically what we did is we set a SMART goal. Um, so here we just said, we started really simple. We said, let's start with fluency practice. I said, that is something that we can upskill your staff in really quickly. Um, let's do fluency practice, repeated reading, fluency pairs and choral reading. We'll start with those three. Um, we'll do it during the literacy block in the classroom with the teacher or the learning support staff. So there was learning support staff that we upskilled as well um, and with a partner. So some were doing partner reading. Um, we said the goal was to increase the words per minute and each group had a different um, words per minute, if that makes sense, depending on where they were, and by the end of term four. So we just went through that. Um, we looked at class A, so we had we had to tier them because the spread was so incredibly large, we put them into different tiers. So class A was minimal risk. So the focus there was on, um, we noticed there was, they were, there was lots of errors. So we just wanted to reduce those errors, um, practice on express, expression rate and accuracy in that group. Class B was strategic support, so they had some risk. So the focus was increasing reading speed. 
Um, and then class C was that intensive support. So that was back to focusing on letter sound knowledge, um, which hopefully then would increase the reading speed. So they had yeah, 250 minute sessions. Um, that was a smart goal there. Then there's your timetable, which you did just sort of touch on. Yes, yeah, so this was my timetable last year. So you can see that I had some literacy blocks um, in there. So it was two sessions a week. But as I said, this year, we now have three sessions a week um, across the whole year. So we're able to target those students that are coming in from the first day of school, not waiting until halfway through the year to actually get some data. From them. So. Um, then we were up to the develop and plan stage. So we just went on to the five from five. Um, I know, you know, these guys came out and did an observation day here on one of our open days and went around and watched particularly in that five, six area, what was happening in that literacy block. Um, so we talked about what reading fluency is. We did our own, um, professional knowledge and that's where all of the whole group, which was a few ed support staff as well, mm -hmm. um, came along and yeah, just understanding that we know we've got a problem. We've now identified it. Now, what do we do to teach these students? So we just went on, um, we made a commitment. So choral reading, repeated reading, echo reading, and fluency pairs were the four things that everyone was going to try. Um, and then these guys also completed the solar course um, as well, which was amazing. <laughs> then uh, we met weekly, where we sort of could, it was nearly every week, there's a few weeks, you know, might have been fortnightly. Um, lots of emails back and forth. Um, we analysed Dibble's progress checks, so they started straight away just doing progress monitoring um, to ensure that what we were doing was having an impact. Um, who was making great growth and needed to change groups? So I think that was something we had a lot of conversation around, um, is these weren't groups that stayed. It was flexible each you know week or fortnight when they were assessed, where do they need to move to? So some were making quick gains. They were in class you know, A, they might jump into B. Or some that were up in that top class, might have moved back down because they weren't making growth. Um, yeah, we had long talks about that tiered um, intervention and what that looked like um, and just continued to talk about strategies. So, you know, you might have been doing fluency pairs and someone else was doing it differently. How should it look at, at, at our school at Mount Rowan? Um, what are the expectations and those non-negotiables? Could you add anything else in there, Belinda? Um, it's something that we're still working on this year. Uh, we've spent the whole first term just getting routines into place, um, especially with the whole group of new staff. So we've now got seven literacy teachers um, who are teaching it and, and most of them haven't seen uh, the program or what we're doing in literacy before. So they needed to learn the routines and, and learn what coral reads and echo reads and repeated reads and all of that was. Um, and likewise, the students needed to get uh, into routines that they were familiar with. So it did honestly take a whole term and probably a term and a bit to get kids in routines because they found it boring or they weren't interested or they hadn't bought in yet and they were there was arguments back and forth I want to be in that class so we just had to hold firm and what we have now is classes that are humming along for the most part quite well and the main reason for that is we have buy-in because students are seeing their data grow because we can have those honest conversations you are here this is what we are working on you did a fantastic job today you worked on xyz great work um and they they as soon as they see uh their results are starting to improve and also when we stop um I guess pretending that we um, know where to meet them, we actually do this time because for me, I didn't know how to have those conversations with them up until this point. So I felt like I was almost lying to them saying, I know you've got a problem, but I don't know what it is. Now that I can meet them where they're at, they're like, finally, someone who understands where I'm at and they're getting on board, which is probably one of the biggest things we're seeing, particularly with our tier three intervention students, uh, when you can have those honest conversations um, through this upskilling process, it's been the most amazing thing for our kids. So this um, data was obviously, if we're thinking end of last year, um, you can see in here, we just did some little calculations, 89% of students were showing growth in words per minute. 50% um, showed a reduction in errors, so we were tracking that, and 56 had growth in accuracy. Um, you know, some November observations where students were motivated and enjoyed those lessons, so they actually liked coming along because they could see they were learning, um, can see their own reading improvement, and we're looking forward to seeing how many students were below 100 words per minute. So if you have a little look here, for example, in the what's circled in the red, um, they were in class C, which was tier three. Um, someone's moved from, you know, student 374 to 113 words per minute. 
86 to 129, 76 to 96. So you can sort of just see there, um, even this student five here, 128 to 158. Um, so big jumps, and that's just a small little snippet of their pre and post scores. And so this uh, is how we uh, currently tally our data. There's um, a lot more to the spreadsheet, but so the yellow um, three columns is the original test. Uh, and then the green three columns is the mid test. And for some reason I've cut off the end test, but I've only cut off the accuracy. So um, you can see like some students, they might jump from 100, then go to 110 with their mid test and then they've dropped back to 95. And so for a student like that, we start to ask questions or well, what's going on there? You know, it might be something's happened at home and there's trauma and other things or they didn't have breakfast. So there might be a whole host of reasons or there might be something cognitively that we need to unpack. And so we have that information now. We often pair it with the maze data, which is the comprehension version of Dibbles, um, so that we can really see, because a lot of the time we have noticed kids that have low fluency can still have you know, a yellow in their comprehension. So it means that they're quite understanding what they're reading, but they're just really slow. For a student like that, I make the uh, assumption that we'll let it ride for a bit, do some fluency practice, and then see how they're going in a few weeks time. And if they're tracking up in their fluency, then we know their comprehension is gonna track up with it. Whereas if a student is read in their Dibbles um, fluency, and they're also read in their comprehension, that's a couple of double red flags for us. And we say, okay, what else is going on here? They're really struggling to decode. And we know if they're struggling to decode more than 5% of what they're reading, then they're not gonna be able to comprehend what they're reading. So um, we have um, students like the bottom one going from 76, oh, sorry, the second um, going from 79 words to the end of the semester, 146 words per minute. Mm -hmm. Like if you think about the impact of that student in a classroom in secondary schools, um, they can now read the notes on the board. You know, they can competently decode a, an essential question or a learning goal or the notes that the teacher has put on the board or some of um, or most of a science textbook or a humanities textbook. So um, for a student like that, it was simply practicing fluency and all of a sudden we've opened a door and they're able to access content in class. Uh, for other students, like I said, it's a, it's a case of now unpacking, well, where else do we need to look into um, supports for this student? And we sort of just had this conversation around, you know, fluency typically that's happening in our prep one two classes is for how many minutes? Three, three. Yeah, three minutes, you know. And and we've we've spent a lot of time last year and it's made a huge impact that potentially now going forward in year eight and nine, that might be something that, you know, five minutes a day for those students can continue and make a huge difference. It's that such a small thing um, that clearly they've missed, but it's had a huge impact. Um, so that's just the other end of the scale. Yeah. So even our top students, I guess, top bands, um, you can see are still moving with this fluency practice. So it doesn't mean that it's not useful for all students. Um, it certainly means that uh, these ones we can now looking at your, your prosody and your comprehension and, and other strategies that go along with uh, reading, but it's certainly helping our students move uh, in fluency, even if they're in that top blue and green bands. And the conversations then started to go, radio. Um, I feel like I'm doing fluency now in 10, 15 minutes. What else can I do in that lesson? So that's when we started to talk about morphology, um, explicit spelling, lots of different things came into it, bringing in um, texts from other subject areas. And we had Luke come across and do some morphology PD, one of our teachers. Um, so that was a really nice time for that sort of group that was humming along really nicely to delve a bit deeper. So your pat data. Yes, yeah, so the other thing um, was really interesting uh, for me is we have this Dibble starter, but what does that mean compared to our other assessments? Because what I don't want to fall into the habit of is saying, yeah, Dibble data is moving, but no, none of our other data is moving. So I did a quick comparison of our PAT data at the end of the year. So we do PAT every year at the end of the year, same sort of time, uh, except for the year sevens who do it at the start and the end, just so we get a, a ballpark of where we're starting with them. So in year seven, 60% of our students went up between one and three bands of these kids that did the intervention with us. 25% um, remained the same and 15% had results lower. So again, that gives us information to say, well, okay, what's going on here? We can look at their comprehension tests as well and start to unpack that a little bit. 50% went up in year eight between one and three bands and um, like three bands growth in PAT data is absolutely phenomenal. Um, so 
we were very excited about that. So that's half our cohort that we've already pushed in the right direction. 32% um, are remaining the same or very similar to where they were. So that's something for us to think about, but something to monitor because it may have just been an off day or um, you know, they're tired by the end of the year or something like that, but we're certainly monitoring it. And those 18%, as I said before, we're trying to now unpack where are they, what do we need to do next? So, as I said before, we started to uh, reduce our English sessions by one session a week to give that to literacy, because um, we already had the two sessions a week. It's allowed us to have those three impactful sessions every week. Um, we are starting to see some of our students' attendance data is improving because we are meeting them where they need um, and we are helping them grow and they're feeling like they're achieving something. Um, not saying that they weren't achieving anything in the other classes. I'm not saying that it, it wasn't happening, but I'm saying in literacy, especially, we were able to have those honest conversations. They weren't, you know, jumping off the tables as much as they used to, or, you know, you get what I'm saying. Like they, their behaviors are changing um, and they're attending class a little bit more. Um, and for kids that are coming from, um, in our area, particularly a lot of trauma background, that's huge. We're opening doors for these kids that, um, you know, up until this point, we haven't been able to open. And, and now working with Canadian Lead, we've managed to find some keys for them. So that's really exciting. Um, so this is uh, our 2023 data. So 57% of our year eight students are under 100 words per minute. Um, 65 of the year seven students are under 100, 100 words per minute. If you look at our cohort as a whole and you look at the yellow and red bands, 75% of both cohorts are in the yellow and red bands. So only 25% of our cohort um, is in the green or the blue. Um, so that's minimal or negligible risk. And uh, of that, very few of them were in the blue when they started with us um, this year. So that's where we started this year. And this is why what we're doing um, has been so exciting. Uh, at the bottom, you can see, um, so we've got 7.1, they're just grouped, so 7.1. Uh, we do benchmark, so that's this table. Then we have a maze on the next tab, and then we have their progress checks on the next tab. So at any given moment, I can check in or staff can check in, and we can start to say, this kid's here, here, and here in all of their data sets, um, and it's really beneficial. Uh, we have another spreadsheet for the intervention, which I'll talk about in a minute, but it's just been a really helpful way of us keeping track of where our kids are at, all in the one space. We have a year seven one and a year eight one. And that's where we sort of spoke about, and I know this is where I've been chatting with Woodlands Hill about being really transparent with our data. And, you know, we do, we collect dibbles at the end of the year. Why are we not sending that off to those high schools if they're using it? Um, the intervention, you know, tutor over there, she was saying, I'm doing it then at the start of the year. I could actually be planning, I could come across, you know, meet the child, do a dibbles assessment with them, having those relationships and even just going to high school and saying, what assessments do you do? You know, and if it's not the same, it's fine, but you can sort of share what you've got and just having those conversations about the child um, so that if you have got similar assessments, I know um, both at secondary college, they're a link school as well. Uh, they actually came across because they were really interested in what we were doing with Mount Rowan. Um, and they've gone, oh, well, we're doing dibbles, contacted their primary school, they're doing dibbles. So they were doubling up, you know, so straight away they've got this transition process in place or, you know, starting to become in place um, where they're going across at the end of each year, collecting some samples, coming back and planning for the next year. So I think, yeah, working smarter um, and together can be really, really, or is really powerful. And we've started this year going out to some of our feeder schools um, and having some of the secondary schools around the area, either talking or even down from Southwest region coming in. So we're starting to try and open this up to um, ensuring that we don't have to, as as Ella says, double up on the data. So we've had um, conversations with our feeder schools, um, particularly the primary schools, saying, well, you know, if you're doing this, could we come in um, in turn four and really uh, start to introduce ourselves to these students that we know we're going to need to work with in intervention. So it starts giving them a familiar face before they come to secondary school. And likewise, um, the teachers or the prince and teachers have started talking about, well, what kind of um, transition information pack could we put together uh, with statements and, and data and things like that so that when the kids are coming across, uh, we're not having to dibbles test them 
um, in uh, on their orientation day as well as in the first day that we see them, we're kind of just hitting them in, you know, and they're like, is this all secondary school is? We're just going to get assessments. And even though they're only one in three minutes, um, it can get quite tiring for the kids. So uh, we've tried uh, starting that process um, and it's something we're looking to continue to grow next year, um, which will be re really exciting. But um, it's definitely worth talking to the schools around you in your area and saying, well, how can we help each other? Because we've learned so much from coming into a primary school um, about what we can do with our students and vice versa. I hope there's some things that Alice has been able to take back and, and bring back to primary schools. Um, it's definitely a two-way street. There's no divide because we know we've got kids in primary school working in secondary school level and vice versa. So, yeah. And I think it's that I did go into Mount Rome going, like, what? I'm just gonna share what we do and take it or leave it. Um, and that, that can be what you do when you go into your secondary school, say, you know, this is what we're doing. Does anything align? Is anything similar? The answer might be no. That's fine. You've asked the question. You might be able to persuade them on something um, or, you know, be able to send them with something. But that's where we, I went in with that open mind and just said, look, I'm going to share. I'm not sure if this will help you. Um, and they jumped on board and to see where it's evolved in a year um, is pretty incredible. So. I touched on this before, but we had a really good conversation one afternoon um, about streaming. We're like, is what we're doing streaming? We don't like streaming. We, you know, what are we doing? Um, and we just had that really good conversation with Paula that what we're actually doing is a tiered response to intervention. We have a number of students in year seven and eight um, who are in tier three who need to be moved back down to tier one. Um, and as you've seen, we've been able to move a lot of those students down. So we just had to make sure that what we were doing, um, we were meeting regularly, talking about data, they were looking at progress checks, deciding that, you know, that student needs to be moved. They've now exceeded the number. So we sort of based it on the words per minute scores and then they changed the whole time. So that's um, how we sort of, yeah, talked about it and we made sure that those groups were really fluid. So tier one is our literacy classes. So the three sessions a week that every kid gets. Um, tier two is, um further intervention uh, no sorry Oops, yep. two again. tier two was that middle group who middle were group yep, who, who we knew we could so, push to above 100 yeah um so with our intervention um the kids that we know that we can move um but aren't quite at a tier three stage and what we've got this year so in addition to our three intervention this is where Anne talks about the perfect storm and we had um, a principal who was willing to give us as much rope and as much resources and as much help as we could possibly get we had um, really great support from Canadian lead and Paula and other people in the region we had a team who was willing to work with us um, and it's been very much a case of we're not quite sure but we're willing to give it a go and we take the feedback good bad or otherwise and we make changes um, so we have in addition to our three sessions a week, we have an additional uh, staff member, three um, who are most familiar with um, either the intervention program, so Katie and myself taught it last year, or someone, um, Nikki, who's come from a primary school background, uh, do intervention. So whilst those three classes are running in the library, Katie, Nikki, or myself are also in there and we're taking out kids to do one-on-one -on -one or small group intervention. What we found is that of those kids who are under 100 words per minute, we took anyone that was 60 words per minute or less and we did a phonics screening test and almost all of them didn't know at least three to five letter sounds. So when you have kids in year seven and eight who don't understand what K is, they can't read it on the board. Any word that has it in it is beyond them. And they simply are sitting there staring at the page going, well, I feel really silly right now. So what we've done is for those kids, we've gone back and done some really significant um, like phonics teaching. Uh, and some of our stu students are going from 30 words per minute to about 80 words per minute, which is absolutely massive for those students. Uh, they're decreasing errors. They're coming to school more. They're running out of class. We actually have them fighting over who's coming to intervention first. Um, because in addition to this, we have a learning support officer. This is where I say Sharon is an amazing print because she gives us resources. I go to her, please give us more. And she obliges because she knows that this is, is working. So 
Uh, Katie and Ikirai are doing the intervention, and then we have a learning support officer who is supporting us doing the progress checks each week. And so we have little um, strategies for those students. If you get certain words per minute or decrease errors, you get a sticker, and then if you get enough stickers, you get a prize and so forth. But what it means is kids are constantly coming in and out of classrooms, so there's none of this I'm going to intervention, I'm different, I don't want to do it. And we have one student, the one that's gone from 30 to 80 words per minute. I've been working for 12 months trying to get that student to do any kind of intervention, even modifying his timetable. So he ducks in and no one sees that he's there and he goes straight to intervention. We'll never bar of it. He is coming out of classes willingly now to go to intervention and he is understanding all of his um, letter sounds now and he's starting to decode words far better. So um, it has been a perfect storm um, and it has been amazing. But um, so that tier three is pulling those kids out individually or small groups, essentially working on phonics and some decodable books. And eventually we'll keep working through the strategies yeah. with Alice's support. And the fact I think to yeah, going in, they've bought the whole heap of decodable books. Um, you know, being prepared to do that in a secondary setting um, is pretty massive. So yeah, oh, there was our slides that you just spoke yeah. to. That's okay. <laughs> Um, and you spoke about that. Good job. We're sort of jumping ahead. So this is some of our um, results for our students. So um, you can see 45 words with four errors. Um, you know, that's, you know, a student that was eight words per minute. They've also got dyslexia and um, some of them are ESL, but three words per minute in year seven or eight is alarming by anyone's standards. So, um, but the, the point is, it's not about saying, well, what's gone wrong, who hasn't done what. It's about saying, okay, this is where we're at. What are we going to do about it? Because there's literally no point looking at the past and saying, you know, except for maybe getting some trauma history and what's happened. It's a case of, well, what can we do now? And that's exactly what we're doing. Um, you can see it's just a snapshot of one of our timetables. So A means that that's our intervention class. So we go there and the other three teachers will be teaching the classes at the same time. Perfect. So we've upskilled our literacy team. Um, each week I have a PLC meeting, although we've changed it to fortnightly this uh, last couple of weeks. But um, the first bit was realistically just upskilling staff, teaching them what to, uh, it meant to do a repeated read or a call read or an echo read, teaching them how to do progress monitors, um, filling in gaps, you know, helping with the student management and really making sure that we had the same sort of systems running through. And we've got the PowerPoint coming up with um, what we do in each lesson and it's grown from there, but um, really trying to make sure that we're all on the same page, that students are all getting the same thing and that we're seeing this data move um, with fidelity. So. so here's your example. Let me just check the, what time is good. <laughs> so this is our PowerPoint. I've added to it now, but um, this is what I sent out to all of uh, the literacy team at the start. So our goal is developing fluency skills. The letters in the top relate to our um, instructional model. So um, if you're wondering what they are, so G is for goal, A for access and prior knowledge. So we um, are bringing in um, information vocabulary. So we started with vocab. We pull out some words from... Thank you. So um, we pull out words from the text we're about to read. Initially, our vocab is purely students need to know this word so they'll understand the text. Um, that's where our vocab intention is coming from. At the moment, it will change and we will start to develop that. Uh, so we'll have a word, we'll have a definition, we'll have three of them or four of them per text. Then we move on to an echo read. With our three lessons, we start with an echo read, which is teacher-led. Then we move to an echo read, which is student led, student volunteers, definitely. We don't pick students to read and put them on the spot, but they get to volunteer. And then the last one is a call read. So any student that wasn't familiar with the words or the content, by the time they've seen it three times, hopefully if they've turned up every day, um, will be able to read that with us, with the class. And again, with the call read, if they're still not familiar, they can just go quiet for a word, jump back in when they're comfortable. So um, we do have that in a system at the moment. Same with the vocab, first one's definition, Second one is syllable synonyms, and the last one is sort of a morphology based. We're looking at that at the moment, saying, okay, that's worked well. Is it our best practice? And we're looking at whether we remove the syllables um, and whether we start to implement more spelling rules and things like that. So it's a it's a constant changing um, dynamic, but it's a fun 
process. <laughs> um, then we do fluency pairs. We talked about likability and mixability, and I know there's heaps of um, pros and cons to both. We currently still do likability um, purely because we have such a range of students and um, we're just really trying to get the confidence going. Um, once maybe by the end of the year, we can start doing some mixed ability students, um, but we do our fluency pairs. Then we add their graphs to a result, uh, their results to a graph so that they can, um, we can see their results really quickly. I can open anyone's book and see week read one, two and three where they've got to. Uh, we have some kind of um, independent task and this is where teachers can do the progress checks. So in addition to our learning support officer, we have teachers trying to do progress checks. So they're owning their students' data. They're having conversations with them that 20 or 30 seconds per kid after a um, one minute read is really beneficial. And then we have a closing activity. Um, this year, we started with just some um, text that Alice had gave, given us for the Coral Reads and FO Reads, but this term we've introduced um, content from other subjects. So we spend three weeks on each subject. So we did humanities at the start, and then we're doing um, science at the moment. We've just done some um, on the referendum and Marbo Day and things like that. Um, so it's really nice to be able to introduce other things that are happening in the world, because where else do you teach them in the curriculum? Um, and we're finding kids are buying in more, but the most exciting thing is when they go to humanities and they say to the humanities teacher, I know what an Aztec is. It's like, yeah, good, because we've done that in literacy. So um, it is actually having an impact on other classes as well. So uh, we just got some feedback from our staff, some positives and challenges and um, things that, so I asked my PLC team last year, well, what are some things that are going well? What are some challenges that we've had? Um, and then our plan for this year, well, let's see if we've actually nailed this. <laughs> um, so we are incorporating text from other subjects. So it was a little goal we gave ourselves at the end of the year, and we are doing that now, we're seeing the benefits of it. Um, so they're front loaded and they're not as, you know, um, challenged when they're going into the classroom. Um, and explicit teaching of morphology, um, which we were hoping to work with Alice on, and we have been. Um, but as I said, we're now looking at more synonyms, syllables, morphology, spelling rules. Where do we, we can go? help you with spelling rules because yes. we've just kind of been around that. <laughs> um, so see, that's but that's where this partnership yeah. works. It's absolutely amazing because there's no that's ours. You can't have it. It's just let's share it and let's get all of our kids reading because that's kind of the whole point, isn't it? That every student gets access to. Um, things that are working for them and, and improving themselves. So. And I think then a takeaway as a link school leader um, is, you know, something that we started on fluency a number of years ago and that now for us isn't, it's just part of our everyday practice, um, to be able to take something little from our school that has a huge impact and be able to see them where this group of teachers have just absolutely run with it um, is pretty amazing. Um, that collective efficacy and taking responsibility. So as Belinda just said, it's not their students and our students. We, these are students, these are kids. Um, we need to teach them to read if they can't read. What can we do about it um, to have a really positive impact and something that we can do, there's a sense of urgency, particularly when they are in those upper years. And I think we, I know personally, we feel that in a primary school in five, six, when you've got kids sitting in a room that can't read, um, I can uh, you know, only imagine how that feels as a secondary teacher when you've got students then who think I can't get a job because I can't read or access anything like that. Um, so I think, yeah, the more we work together, uh, we can have a huge impact for our students. Um, it's made me reflect on my own learning. I know that I've spoken to lots of people, you know, what do you think? I'm going to Mount Rowan. They've got this situation. You know, it's not, we know everything. It is that you know, seeking advice, we're doing this PD, you might want to try it. Um, that solar course that you guys did, you know, they just jumped straight on board, went and booked it. Uh, so it's just all of those, yeah, reflective um, practices and conversations, um, collaborative, and it's been that gradual release. I know, um, you know, we worked together, you know, each week almost last year. I think I've seen you guys once this year. <laughs> oh, sorry. Um, but they've got so many schools going to them and that's that gradual release that now, you guys are experts in that area. Secondary schools can come to you and hopefully there's some secondary schools either here or on the screen. Um, you know, and these girls are, are more than willing to share, you know, what they're doing. They've opened up schools. They've had people, I had COVID, which I wasn't able to get to, but an open day where people came and watched their um, teaching and practice. So I think, yeah, it's been really powerful um, for us and, um, you know, exciting when you do actually talk about it and think about sort of what impact we've had. Um, but yeah, that's really, is it, oh, is that, yeah. oh, sorry. 
Oh, oh I didn't see this. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, so I think building that strong network with our colleagues, and that's colleagues within our school and the broader network. Um, I think, as Alice says, expert, I don't think I'll ever consider myself <laughs> an expert. And there's absolutely things that I sit there and go, in, in my literacy lesson, I'd really love to implement this, but I don't know how to do it yet. So I'm still learning morphology because it's, you know, it's something that I've never really been taught um, and never really learned how to do and spelling rules. And then Alice says, here, well, we'll help you with the spelling rules. And that's kind of the point um, of this uh, program and, and process realistically is that we'd love other schools to be doing that. And then eventually we have everyone just kind of sharing and communicating and offering. And I'm, I'm really, you know, uh, passionate about this. So I've got heaps of resources and putting that forward and then someone else is passionate. And then all of a sudden we have everything covered because all of us are working together. Um, so it's primary schools and secondary schools working together, but it's also internet work and, you know, um, regions and, and areas all working together. So um, building staff capacity, it's been a very, very challenging process of saying, I don't know, and being comfortable with saying, I don't know. And that's one of the biggest things I've built in the literacy team at the start of the year is it's okay to not know. We don't really know. We're trying, we're learning, we're growing. What do you know? I had um, experts in my team that know a lot more about certain areas than I do and we're working together and getting really comfortable with your team and saying it's okay to not know um, and it's okay to reach out for help and then working with other schools to, to build that as well. Um, developing strong curriculum um, that really is targeting our needs of our students, as you can see, we're really starting to have those conversations with our kids and say, this is where you're at, but this is where we're going and this is how we can get you there. Um, we feel that we have filled that gap. Um, I can now say fairly confidently that within the realms of fluency and comprehension, I can say this is where my students are at along the curriculum. And also this is what I can do about it, which is the most exciting thing that's come out of this. So thank you. <laughs> thank you. And I think probably we're not going to jot down things, but it's about thinking about, yeah, who your feeder schools are. Um, you know, and I think no matter where you teach in a primary school, it's what we do now that can stop this from happening. Like I think, you know, our five, six teachers, yes, they might talk with that secondary school, but in prep one, two, three, four, what are we doing right now so that we don't have that number of students, you know, heading off into secondary school, not being able to, yeah, access that curriculum. So the hope um, is that we put ourselves out of a job. I've said that to Shona before with that intervention that's needed. Yeah. Well, yeah. realistically, I want that because yeah. then it means all of our students are reading. Um, so the intervention we're hoping won't be needed as much and maybe the three sessions of literacy only become a year seven thing. Um, and I said with the data, we've just started, we're halfway through or three quarters of the way through our mid dibbles test. 95% of our students are moving forward. That's phenomenal for any test. Um, students are moving from anywhere between four and 40 or 50 or 60 words per minute. Um, and we have a whole class that started, admittedly, they were that top tier class, but they were still starting in sort of yellow and green and a couple of blues. Everyone except for two kids is now blue. Yeah. So we have a whole group of year seven students who are ready to fly. And so we're now looking at it going, well, what else do we need to add to that literacy lesson? But that is amazing. So it's working and it's taken us only half a year to get there. Yeah. 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 Questions are always tricky because I don't know that they can hear when we ask them before, so you might need to repeat. Okay. We ask you you just put one online, um, just asking how often do you do the progress checks? Progress checks. Yeah. Okay, so the question was, how often do we do progress checks? Uh, the answer is we try to do them every single week. Uh, for our students that are in that red or yellow, we really aim to do once a week, if not twice a week. Really depends on whether our learning support officer and our teachers can get there um, to each kid, depending on what's happening in the classroom. Uh, the students who are in the green or blue, uh, if we're running short of time, once a fortnight, um, but nothing less than that. So we're at least seeing them once a fortnight, ideally once a week or more for the progress check. Belinda, you said that, um, you talked about your current year rates and how many of them were at risk. And I'm just wondering, because then you had also said how pleasing that year seven data was last year. New kids coming in or... Uh, just talk to me a little bit about that, like that, because that's the same cohort of kids, year seven, year eight this year. 
So the year sevens last year that moved yes, into year eight. Yeah, yeah. Yep. So we only saw half of them whilst we were working with right. Canadian League. I can't even see that and, and really yep. we only did maybe a terms a term and a half worth of a bit of fluency. It was really a let's do some um, fluency pairs, let's do some poll reads, and that was kind of the extent of it. Yep. Having said that, I, I was looking at their data today, and there's one student who I had in my literacy class last year, which was the lower level of year sevens, uh, and she's moved from the 40s last year, and she's well over the 150s this year. So it is working, yep. um, but it was just a case of we didn't have a structured program in the same sense that we do this year, last year, because we're still building it. Yeah. Um, and also, but those ones that I'm very conscious when I'm going through the data of checking uh, whether the students have made growth or not that yes. I was working with last year, yes. um, and most of them are moving. Yeah. I think that is important to add that out of that whole cohort, there was only half that were part of this program because it was semesterly. So whereas this year, it's the whole lot. It's the whole lot. Yeah. I've just got a clarifying question. Are you progress checking every student in seven and eight cohort, every single student? Every week. It takes one minute and then you have a 20 second conversation. Yeah. So that's where in the slide we have that independent task. It's 10 or 15 minutes. Our target is to do five progress checks. Doesn't always work, but our target is to, to try and see five students, one minute read. Once they're in those routines, which is crucial because you're reducing cognitive load on teachers and students, means that um, kids are safe, they're comfortable, they're orderly, they come in, they get into their um, independent task and you just say, Johnny, come over here. They sit down, they're really familiar, they read for one minute and then you say, you know, you really worked on your prosody today or um, remember that you've got to be really careful because last time you were rushing and you kept skipping the word that. And so then you can have those conversations. It takes you a minute and 20 seconds and then they move back and the next kid comes in. So you can really get through them quite quickly. So yes, every student the aim is in seven and eight. So there's 160 of them and 140 of them. Um, every week is progress checked and that's where our learning support officer is crucial because without them we teachers wouldn't always be able to get to them um, so that's yeah kind of how we get through it yeah. we'll do another quick question how many of you did the solo course last year seven of us seven of you yeah so and of that all of us are teaching literacy this year um we've added one extra literacy teacher this year so that we could allow for that intervention um so yeah seven of us did it last year and we're still trying to unpack all of what was said in there because it was just absolutely you really need to do it twice well five times yes yeah <laughs> um, so yeah it was it was amazing but um we're still trying to unpack it and add it and implement things along with everything else yeah, yeah. well Angela, you said in the gt3 group that you then pulled it in work with them mm -hmm. what did that look like like the program or yeah so we've got the um sound swaps by little learners love literacy and so we're just working through that when we get to vow digraphs we start to move into um decodable books so we're using the totem series or moon dog um series for students it's our starting point we got that from our disability inclusion officer who um, has a master's in literacy intervention so we went and asked her and said what could we use? Uh, and we went and bought them as well. Um, so like I have a student, um, we've had a huge win today. So he uh, has uh, an attention span um, that's almost non-existent. Um, and I, I mean that, I genuinely mean that. Like I could say to him, spell the word cat, and he would go um, cap. And so we'd sound it out and we'd go cap, blend it, cap. Now, what word did I say? And he'd go, cat and I go okay so what end sound is that one and he goes put I said what does it need to be and he goes to I said okay can you swap them and you'll go and put the p back and then you'll grab the p and put it back so that's where his um attention span was and it was genuine it wasn't him being silly he genuinely can't or couldn't um you know with that um attention deficit and, and he's got lots of um information on on his working memory and so forth so we went back and we just did four letters uh, four words with the same uh vowel and then we've done that for two weeks um changing the vowel and last week i started to implement swapping the vowel so i and o we started to swap them and then this week 
would introduce some of the next level. So they're kind of color coded if you know the program. So it's yellow, just gives you like seven letters. And then there's red, gives you another like eight letters. So we implemented half of them at the start of the week, implemented the second half of them this week. And he was going for it and he was getting it because he said, you need to be really careful. If you want two stickers, you have to work on concentrating and listening. And he was 99% accurate. Mm -hmm. So for him, he's the slowest one in terms of progress. The others, you know, they're flying through, they're learning their letters, their sounds, and then smashing it and they're onto the decodable books. So, yeah. How long are your sessions for? Is it the Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so tier two is all the classes together. Um, so there will either be two groups or three classes, depending on the timetable. And we will have an intervention staff in addition to that. And they will pull out either an individual student or a group. At the moment, it's mostly individual because they've all got different phonics needs. Um, but they will work with them usually for three to five minutes, maybe a bit so more, a bit less. Extra time, it's no. extra in, like, um, yep. like intensity. Yeah. The yep. So whilst the rest of the class is working through that PowerPoint with their teacher and doing their call reads and echo reads, we pull them out and do the phonics stuff and then send them back in and grab the next one and it just works. In the system. Are we using your maze data? So maze, not a lot at this stage, uh, purely because if kids can't read um, in terms of fluency, yeah. then the maze is kind of the next part. That class that we now have blue, um, we're going to be looking at saying, what's their maze? What can we be doing there for comprehension? Also looking at introducing other texts for them to read. Yeah. Just one more <laughs> questions? Yeah. yeah. Um, I write down two things because I love I love quotes and I just think this it just made me think of you um if not me then who like who is going to do this yep. if we as teachers don't do this yep. and it, and you as secondary teachers that like you said they're in your schools no matter what these kids hopefully we can stop this from happening as much in the future mm -hmm. but that's right you've got to love the kids you've got and yep. and deal with the radical acceptance of data that's called yep. you know there are three they are a three so if not me then who and then the other one is whatever it takes mm -hmm. and that's what reminds me that, that just reminds me if you believe like whatever it takes these kids will learn to read and i yep. think that's just so inspiring and that's why here tonight because it's so exciting and so so great schools working together i just think something magic happens when we look outside our own schools. Um, it just, yeah, it's an incredible thing. So thank you so much. Thank you for saying yes. <laughs> Although I think we're, we're an easy- It's really an option. No, it's fine. True, true. You can, no, you will. Yeah, you will. But, the, the, but you first had to present to a room for the prints. I reckon yeah. that's harder. This, this is a be, nice- Yeah, yeah. this yeah. is a it's nice- already done at once. Yeah, yeah. nice. Um, feedback or comments online. Yeah. Really true about- yeah. Such impressive work. Yeah. yeah, so awesome. Changing kids' lives. lives. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So I reckon we can yep. hit the pause button on the record. Thank you again. Can I do this? Oh, no. There we go. We don't see technology. Oh, what did she say? Did you did you pop that? The pants know was listening? Yeah, I tried.